Okay, well, as Bill said, I'm Rich Norgard. Um, this is a really small room. I'm hoping I project enough that I don't have to wear the, the whole speaker system thing. So, but if you can't hear me, let me know and I'll go to the mic. So, uh, anyway, um, just a few things about me. I was born and raised here in Port Clinton. And um, I never saw this ship, but my dad used to tell me about it because we lived like less than a half mile away from where it burned. Uh, and so this site I never actually saw other than in pictures. But um, because he told me about it. Could you go to the mic? They're clattering dishes in the kitchen. Okay. No? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 There we go. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So anyway, I um, uh, I heard stories about the ship that burned offshore from my dad. Okay. Yeah, it's on. Maybe it's a battery issue. Maybe it's a distance issue. Maybe. Testing. Five foot range. This is the low end bar. <laughs> Just sit right down with it. <laughs> Good suggestion. It's not uh, not working. Okay. Right, I'm gonna stay over here next to it. Anyway. Um, if you happen to have been in Port Clinton around 1945, around September, uh, and had bothered to look offshore, you probably would have seen this weird old looking ship sitting there. And you may have wondered, it's gonna drive me crazy. Uh, so you may have wondered what that thing was doing there. And um, as I say, I didn't hear about it until later. And, but once I did, I was sort of intrigued by the, um, by the story, and so I basically spent the last 40 years or so trying to track down what this was all about. So I'm going to basically share a little bit about what I found. And okay, well, I'm going to try talking real loud. Between that and this, maybe we'll, we'll get through. So, anyway. Um, what I found out was is that the um, the British, as little as 150 years ago, the British basically were, were the supreme power in the in in the world, and they made they maintained that power by having a PA system to work, uh, and they uh, maintained that power by uh, by by being the rulers of the waves. They they had uh, they were the preeminent sea power, and they did this by building these huge ships, um, and some of the bigger ones. It would take as much as 60 acres of trees to build one ship, and um, but they spread their power throughout the world, and um, in particular um, India, Southeast Asia, and. And uh, they, what they wanted was uh, goods that they could bring back to, the, to England that they didn't have. And um, so they, they built this power and And what happened was that there were these pri some private merchants who seems to work from next to the private merchants who uh, spread out across the, uh, the countryside here and there were some based in Calcutta who, um, okay, I can't see the little thing. Um, they uh, had a power base in Calcutta and they wanted to build some ships. And so the area in the lower right, you see where it says tennis syrup, uh, basically the British uh, fought a war with uh, Burmese kings in, in 1824 and they took that whole area that's indicated by those little lines there and the turn of tennis from coast. And what they really wanted most down there was, was trees. They wanted teak. And the reason they wanted that is because they cut all their own trees down, building ships that 
took 60 acres of trees to build the ship. And, um, and so they developed this area and they started cutting all the trees down down there and they built, um, uh, this one company called Copper and Company built a series of ships um, in this area. And you can see on this map, if you look down in the, the middle, sort of the left, um, at the very bottom there, you see a little place called Nat Ma. Uh, there was a shipbuilding yard there, and there was a number of very sort of well-known ships that were built there. And the success was um, built there um, over a span of about a year, from 1839 to 1840. So she was launched in 1840 from there, and uh, it's supposed to be just a, lo a local ship uh, sailing back and forth between here and, 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 and India. And that's all she was supposed to be. She was in a real deep draft, and she was basically built to haul goods. And uh, so on her first voyage, she took uh, about 300 tons of teak back to Calcutta from here, and then made a few more trips. And then she was, she was taken to uh, England to be sold off. Um, now, when they, when they built these ships, these tea trees, they, the tea was so dense and heavy that they won't, they won't float when they're first uh, standing, they won't float. So what they have to do is they have to girdle the bark and then let the tree stand for three years uh, dead until, it, and at that point it's dry enough that actually the, the wood will float. So they would cut the tree down at that point and then take it using elephants, which they still use today, take the wood, uh, the tea down to the river, float it down to the um, to the shipyard there at Nat Ma, and, uh, and that's where they fashioned the ship from. So when they were done, this is, this is what it looked like. Um, it was rigged out as a uh, three-masted, what they call a uh, full-bodied sailing ship, and this is an actual watercolor of the ship when it was, uh, you know, before it be, later became a prison. Uh, so it's actually quite attractive. Uh, nothing gaudy or anything, but uh, uh, it's, again, it's quite deceptive because you'll see pictures of it out of the water, but it had a very deep draft. So there's like 20 feet below the water line that you're not seeing of the ship there. Uh, what looks like the, little, the dark squares along the side that look like gun ports are actually false gun ports. They would paint those on so that from a distance it would look like she was heavily armed. Okay, this is the original uh, certificate of registry that I found in London when I went there. Uh, it had been missing, and then I looked through some a bunch of stuff, and, and I finally found it. And um, so that confirmed it was built in 1840. And I'll make reference to the fact that there was some controversy later about when she was built. Okay, so they took her to, uh, to England, and then. Uh, she was she was bought by a company called uh, Mangles, and they used her as an immigrant ship, and they made a voyage to Australia, uh, and then it was sold again a couple of different times. But during this period of time, from 1843 to 1852, she was basically taking immigrants from England to Australia, and then also two trips from India to the West Indies with um, indentured servants from India. And uh, this is when, after she had stopped in uh, British Guyana, this is this is shows the goods that they bought, and then they would put them on sale when they arrived. And uh, about the 200 solar hats was really neat. So what happened was uh, on on the ship's last trip to Australia in 1852. Um, the ship was abandoned by the crew because they had there had been a, a recent discovery of gold and uh, people were just going crazy and so the crews deserted the ships and they couldn't literally couldn't get back to England because there was nobody there to man these ships at all and um, so this is what Melbourne Harbor looked like um, in about in about 1852. Uh, with all the ships there that were abandoned and they couldn't get away. And so part of the effect of the gold rush that they had was that they had basically no place to 
to incarcerate criminals, um, the population exploded exponentially uh, by thousands and thousands of people over just a few short years. And so they, um, uh, there were people getting robbed going to the gold fields, and there was all kinds of crime that was rampant. And they, the government needed to do something to solve this problem of what to do with these prisoners. And so they, they took five ships and they outfitted them as prisons floating in the harbor there in Melbourne. And success was one of those. And this is what it looked like as a prison ship when they cut it down and took the, the mass, the two, two masts off, and then the middle one they cut it down and left a little um, bridge kind of a deal there to take stuff on and off the ship. But the, this is what it looked like. They, they painted these ships yellow to distinguish them from other ships that were in the harbor. The government, the government maintained a high state of security. They put uh, marker buoys around the ship several hundred yards away, and anybody that got near these ships would, would be under risk of getting shot at. So, um, so they, what they did was they I, I told you about the deep draft of this vessel. They added another deck below the one, below the middle deck that already existed. And on those two bottom decks, they built rows of cells um, on either side of the long hallway. And uh, there were a total of about 80 cells that were built to hold uh, prisoners. The, um, so there, it was very, as you can see, it was very cramped in there. And uh, these are these are the cells that they built, and um, there would be either, uh, on, the, on the lower deck was for the more, the more um, less well-behaved prisoners, and there was only one person to a cell. The cells were very small, um, basically about three by six, and um, and then the ones in the middle deck were a little, were a little larger, and there'd be, they would put three prisoners in those, and those prisoners were allowed to actually go on shore, and engage in public works projects. So they use them to build roads and um, uh, things like that on shore. But the prisoners on the lower deck, the only time they got out of their cell was once, uh, once a day, they got to go up a deck and walk around for an hour for exercise. And um, they would have like that ankle chains like this attached to their ankles all the, all the time. They never, once they got on the ship, and they were attached, they never came off. So, you know, people would like wear these and they'd go lame and stuff like that. It was, um, and, and the uh, conditions were very harsh. So in the winter, it was very cold and in the summer, very hot. And um, So there was, um, the, the, the superintendent of this prison establishment was a rather infamous fellow who um, had established a reputation for cruelty and he, unfortunately, he was placed in charge of, um, I came out of retirement from a, a previous job to be put in charge of the uh, prison system there in Victoria, which included the five prison ships. And he um, um, was very hated by the prisoners. They kind of had knew him from before. And um, and there, what, what happened was there ensued a, um, a lot of disgruntlement among the prisoners, and there was there were investigations that were hinted at, and and the government actually um, um, you know started investigating that maybe there was some problem there with the prison conditions, and so this was going with this in backdrop sort of um, uh, he was murdered in uh, in 1857 by prisoners when he went to investigate a complaint. They surrounded him and they beat him with shovels and rocks and, and things. And so now some of the prisoners on the ship were actually um, uh, became quite well known. Um, Owen Suffolk was one of the better known ones and they actually um, later on because of his sort of notoriety somebody for instance wrote um, you know a song about, about based on one of his poems and uh, published it. I have that book here. But he, uh, he wrote this book called Days of Crime and Years of Suffering. And he actually started writing it when he was on the success uh, in 1858. And then he finished it. When I got out of prison, he later finished it and it was published. 
and actually became rather well known. And um, so he is known for that. And uh, uh, and then uh, man, man, Mad Dan Morgan, who is sometimes referred to, although not correctly, as Mad Dog Morgan. Um, there have been movies made about that. Dennis Hopper was in a movie called Mad Dog Morgan. <laughs> and so forth. And so, one of the characters that was on the success. Um, Harry Power is a rather well-known individual, although less so um, than the individual. individual he's known for mentoring, who is Ned Kelly. And if you're an Australian, you would, Ned Kelly would be sort of an instantly recognizable name. Uh, he's sort of like, like their version of Jesse James uh, or Billy the Kid. So Ned Kelly was this was this famous bush ranger. Well, Perry Power was the guy who taught him, and um, all he knew about bushcraft and horseback riding and all this kind of stuff. And um, and so he was one of the prisoners on the success, and lit, would later return when the ship went on exhibition and actually become for a short time one of the people who was a tour guide. <laughs> so. Anyway, the, uh, as I said, a lot of um, unrest that was uh, fomenting among the prisoners, and this culminated in a um, uh, what they they call a rush. It's basically attempts to escape. They they termed it a rush, and um, there was a fellow who was a famous bush ranger who was known as uh, Captain Melville. His the name he went by was Captain Melville. He had a a large following, and that he was uh, tried and convicted, and he served time on the success. And um, one day, when the prisoners were or working uh, in the quarry, uh, he led this attempt to escape, and a couple of uh, of the guards were were murdered, and um, the whole plot was foiled. But but this was called the Melville Rush, and the Melville Rush was important because it led to the government actually investigating conditions on on the ships. And, uh, and this ultimately led to the, to the murder of John Price. Um, when, I, when I visited there a couple of years ago, you can actually still see traces of the quarry where the prisoners worked when they came on shore. And the, uh, the, jetty, the, the jetty that goes out, actually the, the prisoners built that jetty that goes out from the lighthouse um, that's there. It's really neat to see. If you ever get to Melbourne, you should go to Williamstown and, uh, and check it out. Okay, so um, so anyway, the success, uh, because of those investigations, they discontinued the, the uh, actual incarceration of male prisoners, but they continued to use the ship for, as the boys reformatory and as a female prison, and, um, and that continued on for a number of years. Until finally, in 1890, the government sold off the ship, and uh, and they sold it to a fellow named uh, Alexander Phillips, who was going to cut it down and make it into a barge. But then um, he started getting uh, people coming on board and asking questions about, hey, what, what's this doing here, and or, you know, what's the history behind this thing? And he got pestered so much with all these questions about it that he said, well, you know, maybe I could make some money charging money for this rather than just making a barge out of it. So. So he changed his mind and he actually started doing um, tour, little tours on the ship and uh, he invited the press to come on board. And this, this photograph is taken shortly after he decided to do that. So it hadn't even been, this actually still looks like, pretty much like it did as a prison ship. Um, and, um, and so he, he realized that he could make money showing this thing around. So. He, he brought it up some investors, and um, they fixed the ship up, which it was in pretty bad shape. They fixed it up, and um, they began to uh, you know make money with the thing. And so one of the things that they did early on was, you know, rather than just have sort of these bland, bare cells below deck, they decided to put these wax effigies on on board and dress them up like prisoners. And and the whole wax um, works thing was really in vogue at the time, and so the local waxworks owner came and said, you know, I've got some um, uh, wax figures that represent prisoners that were on the ship. And they did, they actually had, they had some. And uh, so they, they, they 
were really well done. Actually, they were quite um, artfully, you know, crafted. And they would dress them up in prison garb and put them in there, and they looked very, very lifelike from everything I've been able to read about it. So this, a lot, a number of the cells had these wa wax effigies in them, and that's was sort of part of the attraction of the ship. Um, and I mentioned Ned Kelly. Ned Kelly was, among other things, famous for having um, dressed, decked himself out in, in armor, which was actually made from farm um, uh, farm implements that had been iron implements that had been pounded down and, and made into this this incredibly unwieldy uh, suit of armor, and um, it didn't help him because he was he was uh, tracked down tracked down and shot by the police, and the bullets missed the armor and hit him in the neck. And, uh, yeah. But you. Turns out you couldn't really fire a gun in one of those things or do much or run very fast. <laughs> so uh, it didn't work out very well for Ned, for Ned Kelly. But anyway, so this is one of the attractions on the ship, but it wasn't really Ned Kelly's armor, it was a reproduction. But um, and, and as some later critics pointed out, Ned Kelly really had nothing to do with the ship. Because <laughs> he'd never been on board. But it was it was one of the attractions on the ship. And then again, um, uh, compulsory bath basically was a way for the prisoners to bathe on board and uh, later you'll hear how they kind of embellish this to say that well you know they would whip flog them and then um, and then they would put them in the salt bath to you know increase their torture but that actually was never done that was that was all embellished but uh, so but there was a um, there was a bath a place to bathe on the ship for the prisoners um, so it was taken to Sydney, it was picked up and you see they put the mask back up on it and they took it to Sydney and, um, and it started to do very, very well and they were going to take it um, at that point to the Chicago World's Fair of, in 1893 and then people got wind of it and um, people, got, people got wind of it in Sydney and Sydney's a little more of an upper crust town, you know, Melbourne is kind of a working class um, sensibility, but you know, Melbourne is, Sydney's always been kind of like a little more um, hoity toity. And they really didn't like the idea of, um, and also Sydney is where, you know, the British sent most of their convicts. And so a lot of the people who by 1890 um, were, were living there were descendants of convicts, and that was not something at, the, at that time that they were very proud of. And so the appearance of the ship was rather unsettling for some of the, the richer folks in town. And so um, people were, would sneak aboard and, you know, smash the wax figures and, um, you know, and, and engage in various forms of vandalism. And then the ship um, in June of 1892 sank. And uh, many people attribute that sinking to um, to be sort of potentially scuttled, although there is a lot of um, uh, evidence to actually to the contrary, but um, uh, that's one of those things. They, it's suspected that uh, that, it, that it was scuttled, but I'm not sure if that's true. So anyway, they had uh, issued a prospectus um, to uh, raise money to, uh, uh, to take this thing overseas, and um, it was in Brisbane, 1893. It still looks pretty rough, as you can see. Um, and then finally, they get enough money. They raise enough money, they're going to take it to England. So they take it to Adelaide, um, and after a year on show there, they're, here they're fixing it up to, um, to take it overseas. Interesting in this picture, well, two, two things. You can, you can really appreciate the depth of the, of the ship and how much was underwater, um, which made it very, very slow. Um, but you can obviously see that it was what it was designed for was to carry car. That's what it was designed for. Um, but below the waterline, you can see how it kind of looks shiny and light colored. That's copper, or it's rather it's a copper alloy. They, they call sometimes it's called Munz metal. Um, but it's a it's a it's an amalgam of copper and other metals that was used to ward off the Torito worm, which is a sea uh, creature that would bore, actually bore from the wood and um, 
um, especially the oak ships, were really vulnerable to that. Not so much teeth, but it would still attack teeth, but not with as much effect as oak. And ships were known to actually sink because they were all these holes from these worms in there. So that's why they used the copper. And I have some copper trinkets that were allegedly made from copper taken from the bottom of the ship. But I'll talk about that in a bit. So it goes to England and um, does really well there, actually. Uh, makes some good uh, profit for the Australian investors. And um, they, uh, everywhere they go, they put out leaflets and flyers and they um, invite the um, local press to come. And, and, it's, and it's fairly successful. And you can see the, they're doing a lecture um, this fellow off to the far right, his name is Joseph Harvey. He was the business manager when it was in England. And he was a very um, able speaker and promoter. And the fella in the middle with his hand raised, um, sort of demonstratively, his name is Nottingham. And he, he's the one that purchased the ship from the Australian investors uh, about 1910. Okay, so, um, so the ship. Uh, by about 1910 um, or 11, uh, business is starting to trail off, and um, they feel like the ports have pretty much played out. Harvey is no longer with the company, so it's, they don't have his um, acumen at uh, promotion. And so um, it, the, the ship goes to Isle of Man. Mr. Nottingham has bought it. And along comes this American named David Smith, and he's from a little town in Indiana. and um, he really thinks this thing could go to the United States and just be dynamite. He's going to make a million dollars for this thing. And so he manages to convince some, um, um, some investors, hotel owners and so forth, and the Isle of Man to uh, put together a company and, uh, and they take it to the United States. Now, um, you see him, one of the things that he instituted was he had all the lectures on the ship wear, wear British naval uniforms which is kind of funny, um, particularly since um, he had never been in the Navy or uh, had any affiliation with any kind of uh, merchant marine or anything. And in fact, he didn't even like to be on the ship when it was moving. <laughs> so, because he was a farm boy, right? He was from, he was from the farm. Um, but he was, uh, at the time that he found the ship, he was over in Great Britain um, selling zithers and um, Harps, and uh, he was a door-to-door salesman, basically. But he had a gift of, of being able to convince people to do things that he wanted to do. So he got this company on, and they came to the United States. And they, um, so they went to this actually famous place near Lancaster called Glass and Dock, and this is where they did the uh, prepared the ship to go to the United States. And um, they hired a captain. Canadian sea captain named Scott, and um, and then also Smith um, was able to convince uh, Mr. Marconi to um, outfit the success with a wireless device, which was fairly new at the time, and all the, the new ocean liners were getting them, uh, the Titanic and so forth, all had wireless, uh, but never it was they had never been put on a sailing ship before, and and, and Smith had asked Marconi to have one. And he, and he was turned down, and then he actually went to go see Marconi and convinced him to put a wireless on board, provided that one of his operators just went along. So, so the fellow on the left named Gallagher, he's, he was the wireless operator. So um, one of the things that Smith did was he really, to say the least, embellished the history of the ship. And uh, he suddenly invented um, uh, sort of a new paradigm in the history. In other words, the ship had never been termed a convict ship really before, although the term had been used. But Smith actually wrote in, a history, wrote in the book that the ship had been a transported convicts. He, he actually um, put out in publish that the ship had transported convicts from England and Australia, which he had never done. 
So this was new. So he's basically lying. Um, and so that's that's a little bit different. But he, you know, he does things like um, he takes these sets of postcards with these lured photos of people getting whipped and stuff. That never happened on the ship. People were not. Now they were not treated very well, and they were they were beat with um, what they call eddies, um, which is this leather thing that the guards carried around. They they beat the convicts with that when they if they looked at them the wrong way. But they didn't they didn't engage in um, uh, flagellation as a as a means of corporal punishment in any way. So this is something he basically is kind of dreamed up on his own. And um, but they would make the rounds from port to port, and they typically, Smith would go ahead, uh, ahead of the ship, and he would lay down a bunch of money in the local newspapers, take out full page ads in the newspaper, which was very unusual at the time. He would hook up with the mayor and the press, and um, have them and engage in um, um, uh, basically special showings just for them. So that by the time the ship finally opened to the public, it had been advertised for a week or more in the press, and people were just going crazy wanting to see the ship that the governor had already seen, the mayor had seen. And so he was very clever um, the way he advertised this thing. So um, so this was a typical pose with, uh, this is the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island. And that's Mr. Nottingham on the left. He's still affiliated with the company. So, and they would, uh, one of the things that Smith did is, number one, he hired publicity agents, and um, he would set up these elaborate stunts, and um, and they often involved pretty women. Um, and he would, like, say, you know, would you like to, for $100, would you like to be the prettiest gal in Cell 13 on Friday the 13th? And, you know, it was just really, um, really, Amazing how he would, you know, set up these stunts, and um, it was very effective. And he would bring people in, and uh, and the press just ate it up. He had the press eating out of his hand. Um, he had uh, Houdini. Uh, <laughs> he he issued a challenge. I think this was all done behind the scenes, but he issued a challenge publicly to Houdini, uh, saying, "I bet you can't escape from one of the cells in the ship," and so. Houdini said, yes, I can, and so they set it up, and um, um, so he was he was tied up in a cell below deck, um, and he took him about an hour, but he finally got loose of his chains, and he climbed through a porthole and jumped in the, in the, in the river and uh, got away. So, <laughs> it was uh, And so they would do, you know, we'd have weddings on board the ship, and so, I should see as you can see, cell 13. This would have been on Friday the 13th. Okay, so the, sh the ship went to, um, uh, was on the East Coast, made the way around through the Panama Canal, the newly opened Panama Canal, to the West Coast, um, to San Francisco. And I have an actual full page ad from San Francisco newspaper, you know, kind of showing how they would advertise the thing. Um, and um, after the West Coast, it came back around to the, uh, it was going to go back to the East Coast. It, they had never planned on entering the Mississippi River, but um, uh, I think Smith was worried about, genuinely worried about the war and the fact that there was some, well, there was submarine traffic on the, um, on the East Coast and they were having um, sabotage, things were getting sabotaged and so forth. So I think he was concerned about uh, that the ship might become a target or something. But he, anyway, he took the ship up the Mississippi and um, again, the draft issue with how much water the ship drew, the Mississippi River system is not a place to take a deep water vessel. And But he did it anyway. And um, so here you see a typical scene when the ship, was a, the, during the three-year time the ship was on the Mississippi and then Ohio, and they would have to take out hundreds of tons of ballast, remove that from the ship to lift it enough to get through the rapids and so forth that the, uh, the rivers were, um, uh, you know, were fraught with. And um, it would, it was, here it's propped up with these, you know, posts and stuff. So um, ballast, of course, is a very important thing in the ship. 
more so even for a ship with this kind of draft because without ballast at the bottom, something that weighed down, the ship would just keel over. So the only thing keeping it upright was was roughly 200 tons or more of rock ballast um, in the bottom of the ship. And um, so they had, to, they had to do that to get the ship up river and um, they had problems. And a couple of times they actually wrecked on, on, on the Ohio River and um, they would have to wait for the water to rise and so it would sit for months just stuck. And um, during the war, um, Smith didn't want to be seen to be seen pro as property, you know, from, you know, everybody's sort of suffering, you know, everybody's got relatives overseas and all the young men have gone to fight the war. And so one of the things he did was to see Pedro Grada, he would actually invite the Marines to set up the success as a recruiting station. And they actually did it. So several places, um, uh, they did it in um, Cincinnati, and they also did it in Pittsburgh, where they actually recruited Marines on board. There's Smith and his captain suit. Um, they get back to the uh, finally get back to the East Coast, and this this shows they have these huge billboards set up, and you can see the little people in the in the prison guard. You can see on the far left one standing on top of the sign. And as well, looks like a child or somebody standing in front of the sand. But um, so you know, and, and that was for a very brief visit to Atlantic City. And uh, Smith was very disappointed because um, they they didn't arrive in Atlantic City by the fourth because they had some delays and sprang a leak off of Georgia, and they had to go back, and so they didn't make the July fourth opening. And so he was rather. Um, so anyway, this is sort of how typically the ship would look tied up in port. Um, there would be long lines of visitors stretching for blocks and blocks often. Um, and there's Smith um, in a typical scene, and you can see the, the line going way back, 50 cents a piece, which was a lot in those days, 20s and 30s, it was a lot of money. So now by this time, now the ship's in the Great Lakes going around. Um, I would say the heyday of the ship probably came in, in 1925 um, in Chicago because the economy had improved by the mid 20s, and um, you know the roaring 20s sort of kicked in. There was a there was a, a sense of um, you know general happiness among the populace, and people really wanted to go wanted to go see stuff, and so the success did very very well. And this is about the time that, that Smith probably actually made his first million with the ship. But they would um, do things like have the local um, dance troupe or something come to the, the ship and then they would take pictures of them posed all around the ship. And um, it was very much a part of the, of the local entertainment scene wherever it went. Um, and that's um, maybe a little hard to visualize now, but that was kind of the key to his success was um, was sort of getting the acceptance of the general population that this was something that wasn't just sort of a, um, a gimmick, but was actually real entertainment that people would want to go see. And he was successful, very successful at doing that. And because keep in mind, the ship was very expensive to operate. Um, you had, he had to pay his crew, he had to pay towing, which was very expensive to get the, you know, the ship from place to place. You'd have to get taken out of the water periodically to have it recalked and uh, painted and, and so forth, and so um, that was expensive. When the comic ship and the movie star, there was they posed some movie star on the ship, and, and um, so here's the compulsory bath with some um, women from a local theater production or something posed on the ship, and this is a very typical pose that you would see in entertainment, you know local entertainment journals and so forth. And, um, and they had, the thing they had all was lit up at night, and um, this is not a very good picture, but it gives you some sense of sort of the gaudiness or the, the, the image that it projected during at nighttime. Um, okay, so um, I mentioned these copper souvenirs. 
Um, I mentioned Mr. Nottingham, and um, he, well, one of his relatives that I interviewed, I asked about the copper, and he says, well, he said the way Dad used to put it was that um, if, copper. if all the copper used in these souvenirs had actually been on the success, it probably would have sunk her. <laughs> so it probably was some of the original copper used to a point, but then they ran out, they had to use other copper. So. Um, over time, by, by the 1930s rolls around, the depression sets in. Smith was smart and, and got out of the business and sold it to a, an individual who was not nearly as um, gifted as he was in promotion. And um, time was catching up on the ship in terms of the repairs, and it just wasn't kept up like it should have been. And here they're, you know, they're they're uh, nailing canvas to just plug holes. This is when it was going through the, um, coming back to the Great Lakes the second time and going through the um, uh, canal system. This was in Sandusky, and you can see the back line back there, that's just showing the sun to where it was. Um, this is Cleveland. Um, you can see it there kind of in the lower, or the middle, just about the middle picture actually. And that's the, C, the steamer C and B, and back there. Um, I mentioned Harry Van Stack because he was with the ship for about 20 years, from about 1925 um, until the very end. And he became really, without Harry Van Stack, the ship probably would have met a different fate. Because what happened was in the in, in the 40s, in the early 40s, the ship was in a tremendous state of disrepair. World War II was now on, and they needed dockage real bad, and so they were telling the owner, who was a Cleveland printing company owner, that you need to get the ship out of Cleveland, you can't, can't stay here. Um, it's gotta be moved. And he was in ill health, and so basically Harry Van Steck took it upon himself, because he loved the ship, um, to have it towed from Cleveland to Sandusky. And so in a memorable voyage, his, he was having it towed, and it was leaking all the way you know, boards were falling off of it, and his wife followed him in the car along Route Two, uh, kind of frantically, you know, keeping up with him, and just kind of looking to see if the ship sank and he'd have to go, he'd have to go call somebody. And um, but they made it to uh, they made it to Sandusky, and uh, just barely in the fall of 1942 and then managed to keep the pumps running long enough to stay afloat and then but in, the, in the spring of 43 it finally came up the ghost and it's appeared like it appears here um, for roughly the next three years. Um, so it was um, it was okay there for a while and then the Sineski people didn't, were kind of getting a little bit uh, weary of it because this is where the steamer put in bay if you remember that ship. The steamer put bay would normally tie up here, but then it had to tie up at the end. And the city fathers at Sineski were getting a little irritated with it. And um, so along comes a guy named, from Port Clinton, named Walter Colby. Oh, who was that? He was a colorful, uh, local, eccentric um, marine salvager. And um, he kind of got interested in, in doing something with the ship, and um, he made a number of false starts trying to get it moved from Sandusky to Port Clinton. And then finally, um, um, this is what it looked like in the stuck in the ice, Sandusky. Um, oh, by the way, when it was in Sandusky, there was nobody really watching it once it sank. And so this is when people really began to go on board and, um, and vandalize the ship and remove things that were of value, and I mean remove practically everything of value. Um, so a lot of people's basements in the area, I suspect, have objects from the ship. That <laughs> they're not going to be volunteering up in Capo. Um, so Colby finally gets the ship raised enough um, to his credit to actually take it to uh, Port Clinton. And, and this is an interesting photograph because 
um, look on the left side and you can see that there's huge sections of, um, of side beams that are gone. So somebody's already been taking peak off the side of the ship. You can see bare ribs there. And so my question is, how in the heck did he get this thing floating long enough to get it to Port Foot? I can't figure it out. He must have had some pumps going like crazy. Only Walter Colby could do it. <laughs> That's probably right. So, but anyway, it's just, it's just incredible. Um, so they, they do raise it, and you can see a little bit of the steamer put bay in the back there. Um, and Colby, what Colby did was he called uh, Dave Jeremy, the late Dave Jeremy, and uh, Dave Jeremy got his ferry boat, the Islander, um, he beat feet over to uh, Sandusky with it, and he also had a small, small tug, and the Islander pushed, pulled from the front, and the tug pulled from the back to keep it from fishtail, because Dave Jeremy recommended with fishtail if it was, didn't have something pulling in the back. So, so they were going to take it up uh, to Port Clinton. Port Clinton Harbor. That's where Colby wanted it. But about a mile and a half offshore, it just hit bottom. And so after another hour or two of work, they managed to pull it off that sandbar, and they headed east of town. And they basically ran it up as far as they could. And they got about less than a half mile offshore when it finally hit bottom. And that's, that's where it stayed. And um, you can see the standard products in the background. So that gives you some idea where it was. It was um, a little ways off our house there on the East End of Town. Um, right about where the um, Clover Leaf goes around for the, the on-ramp for Route 2. That's just about where it is. And actually, it's killing over as much as I uh, it, it, it kills over, you'll see in later pictures, it kills over more. Um, but initially it didn't, actually was fairly upright. It still had the mast on except for part of the front one. So that was in about the first of September. It got to Port Clinton of, 18, of 1945. And then uh, it's through the winter. It's out there through the winter. And um, um, people are going out there, ice skating out there, and they're climbing on board. Some of the braver local residents climb on board. And they got a lot of visitors, and um, they take more stuff. And um, a, a man in a small, um, um, a teenager, happened upon the ship and they were on the front of the ship and they got to looking at it and thinking boy that figurehead looks really neat <laughs> and so they walk back to shore and they come back with a saw and they lop the head off the figurehead and here you can see see originally I thought this happened when it was out here off uh, Port Clinton but Obviously, we know that it was, those boards were already gone in Sandusky. Okay, so, um, and you can see on the far left, the figurehead would be, you can see the head gone. And you can also see the mass, two masks are now gone. And so now it's July 1946. And in the, sometime in the afternoon, people see, um, Real dark smoke rising from rising from the center of the ship, and um, the fire kind of starts slowly, but it, it gradually spreads. Um, there's a fairly, I don't know, maybe a 10 mile per hour wind, but there's there's some wind and um, feeds the fire, and so it burns uh, into the afternoon and then into the night. Picture from shore. And um, boats gather like moss to a flame. Boats uh, are on there. Taking, people are taking pictures, and uh, it's quite a scene. And um, 
the newspaper talks about how it sort of um, was was the fireworks display for for Clinton, and uh, and so people were watching it. People were there were a lot of holiday people going through vacation land. Of course, a lot of people stopped along the side of the road and watched it. And uh, I love that old sailboat. So this is pretty much what's left by the time the fire's out. This is, this is what's left. Um, if you look about the center of this picture and you'll see a winch, that same winch is now sitting at Doug Fote's place east of town on um, um, is that Pitt? What is it? State Road. State Road. State Road. So he's he's got the he's got the winch, and it was actually where it's sitting now is the middle deck of the ship. So it actually fell and stayed upright. So that whole top is gone, and that's would be the its middle deck. And uh, people often ask me, is there anything left? Well, a, what happened was, over the years, you know, the stuff started to wash away, and of course winter comes and the ice, you know, grips around the wood, and the, the ice carries some away. And then, um, so eventually, you know, the top section is kind of gone, but there's still quite a bit of, I mean, if you think about what it looked like out of the water, how deep that was, that whole bottom section, the bottom, say, maybe um, 12 to 15 feet of ship is all still there, pretty much. And um, there's, you know, tons and tons of rock ballast that's there. And um, a, lot of, a lot of wood and stuff has been salvaged from it, but there's still a lot down there, um, including that massive keel, main keel, that would have brought down the center of the ship. So, and just to show you where it's located on that chart, it's still on charts as a wreck. And then roughly that line I drew to indicate roughly the uh, direction of travel when it it had um, it was originally going to go up the harbor and then and then about a mile and a half off was. Um, Redirected, and so that's roughly the the route it followed when it grounded. People often talk, you'll see people who write about it elsewhere will say, "Well, it sank." Well, it never sank. It just grounded and then burned in place. So, okay. Well, um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Somebody. Somebody went out there and set it on fire. Somebody went out there and lit it. Probably with um, using kerosene or fuel oil or something. Because the black smoke, there was black smoke rising up, so it was, um, uh, there's a lot of speculation. There's rumors around town. <laughs> Everybody's probably heard the rumors. And, you know, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody, but you know, you can sort of guess who had motive to want to burn it. Um, the Coast Guard, now I've never been able to verify this through any actual record or the recollection of any Coast Guard person, but supposedly the Coast Guard had um, told Mr. Colby that he needed to get get it out of there. Um, but obviously, burning it to the water line doesn't get it out of there, it just <laughs> makes it more of a hazard. Because now you can't see it. Um, <clears throat> yes, Paul. In the 50s, Bill and I poking around out there in our 13 and a half foot lineman, we all thought we knew where it was, and we'd give it a wide berth when we'd go around there, but we couldn't see anything. But you say there's stuff still there. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, 
Oh yeah. You're, is there interest from divers? Um, are, are there people that dive to? Yes, there. Um, it's it's not it's not that well regarded as a diving wreck because the visibility is so poor. Um, that's a muddy bottom there, so uh, and the water's always churned up, and so the visibility is like inches. And um, for the water to be anywhere clear enough to see anything, it has to be like caught dead calm for several weeks. We're supposed to have another low water year next year, which will take take the lake down further. You suppose you can see some of it? Um, I don't know if it. I don't know if it's going to get low enough to see anything anymore. There were um, numerous reports that back in the 50s and maybe even early 60s, when low water days, you could still see some things sticking up. I don't know that it's um, just because of the ice and because of um, um, people scavenging things. I don't know if there's enough sticking up far enough. It would be neat if it was, because I'd love to see that. But I just don't know that there is going to be. Yeah. I don't know whether ours is the only family, but we have something that my uncle had built, kind of a really big toy, a prank thing, out of the uh, wood of the success. And there's probably others. I don't know whether he actually wrenched it out himself or whether it washed up on shore, but he made something out of the wood. Yeah, that actually was common. Um, and I have a, an example up here of someone who um, took teak wood from the ship, presumably a piece of wood that had washed up, and they whittled uh, like a letter opener from it. But a, lot, a number of people did that. They made things from it. And um, some people actually, um, you know, actually made money doing things like that. There's people who have sold, have, have taken the cell doors and made coffee tables out of them and sold them. So. Have you been able to verify if it was insured when it burned? Uh, no, but I would. <laughs> I can't think of an insurance company that would have insured this thing. I just don't. I don't. I don't. I very much doubt it, but I don't. I don't know for sure. Anybody else? Uh, Dave Jeremy then was involved only in the towing. He was. That was his. Only as far as I know. Involved. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, before he passed away, I interviewed him, mm -hmm. and he told me the story about how they brought it from Sandusky. Got a call from. Colby one day saying, you got to get over here. Somebody. Yes. The two floors that were cells, were they all wood or were there any metal pieces that would be left? The, the only metal would have been bars, iron bars. There were a lot of, a lot of, and there also, the, the ship was fastened together also with um, iron pieces. So there, and, 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 and maybe some, and maybe some copper. Uh -huh. There would have been, there would have been metal used in the construction also. So there are um, people that have salvaged, you know, beams from it that have, you know, large chunks of, wood. Chunks of yeah, wood with chunks of iron sticking out of them. And um, this, the ship um, displaced uh, over 600 tons when it was built. So um, there was a lot of material there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why, why didn't they salvage it right at first when teak is so valuable? Um, I can only guess that they, at the time, what they would have gotten for the teak wouldn't have justified the expense. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I have um, a number of uh, uh, items to, that you're welcome to come up and look at. I've got photographs. I've got, uh, um, like I say, a number of these copper pieces. I've got these, these um, leg, irons. Leg, irons. leg irons that um, that were on the ship. They were given to me by someone who um, got them originally from Harry Van Stack um, when he was a kid. I also have another publicity list that they sold on board. 
and, uh, and things like that, and photographs, postcards, and so forth. Anything else? Well, thank you very much.